So let me remind you, it was not so long ago what we did. Uh, so we described uh, a modular form. We still haven't finished with the formal definition yet. Uh, as a function. So first we thought about it as a function of lattices, and then we thought as a function on an elliptic curve together with a differential. that transformed in the appropriate way, namely, if you scaled the lattice or if you scaled the differential, you get the appropriate scaling factor, which one can also interpret, interpret in thinking of as the following. So you can take f of e omega and then multiply it by omega tensor k, and then this is just independent of the choice of the mode. So now this is something that we'll be able to interpret uh, in a geometric and therefore an algebraic way. So that's what I'm going to start talking about now, which is geometry. So the first thing we have is that we have a description of elliptic curves up to isomorphism, at least over C, uh, as given by points in the upper half plane, modulo the action of SL2Z. So there's a usual picture that I'm sure you've seen, where given this action on the upper half plane, which is nice and continuous, you can find the fundamental domain is I with rho as follows. Let's draw these lines in here for a moment. So here you have a region omega, so it's every point in the upper half plane after translation by an element of z sl to z lands inside omega. If you're a little bit careful about what the boundary is. And thereby you can interpret these elliptic curves up to isomorphism as points on some nice geometric space. When you take this quotient, well certainly sl to z has translation by one, which identifies this line to this, which you can then glue together, and z goes to minus one on z, identifies this semicircular arc with this arc, and then you glue them together and you get the following, which I'll draw this way, it's a balloon. So off here is the point at infinity, which is just a cusp. And of course, topologically, you just get exactly this, a sphere minus a point. But if you also want to think about the complex structure here, you also have this as a complex manifold, as long as you're a little bit cautious or circumspect about what happens at i and rho, namely at the point i, you have a cone point of angle two pi on two, and at rho, you also have a cone point at two pi on two. So here, well, you know what i is, and rho is equal to e to the two pi i. So you have this underlying geometric structure, and it is, well, of course, you can, you can think about this in two ways. One, you could try to think about it as a complex orbifold. Alternatively, you can just forget the structure, these points here at i and rho, and then you can try and think of, well, let's just think about this is the Riemann sphere minus a point, how to unifies the Riemann sphere. Well, you want to unify it by a parameter. You have elliptic curves. Elliptic curves are determined up to isomorphism by their J invariant. So in particular here, you can also think about this ignoring the orbifold structure as somehow an A1 with a coordinate J, which is the J line. So this is a way of giving this quotient and now a nice uh, algebraic structure in terms of the affine line. You can even think about this not just over the complex numbers, but even over the rational numbers. You know if you have an elliptic curve defined over the rational numbers, then so is its J invariant. So let me now also talk a little bit about level structures. So I'm just going to talk about one very specific kind, although others will certainly be implicit. So instead of lattices, we can think about pairs of lattices. 
for a set of lattices, consider pairs of one lattice mapping to another, well, we say including inside another, which has index p. So if you think about the collection of these sets, that certainly maps just to lattices. And moreover, this has index, or rather, the preimage of, of any point has degree p plus 1. In other words, given uh, a lattice, there are exactly p plus 1 lattices, which it includes in, in index p. Another way of thinking about this construction, so certainly if you have an inclusion here, you also have an inclusion into 1 on p times the lattice. And so another way of thinking about that is your lattice, well, maps to 1 on p lambda modulo lambda. If we now think about this in terms of elliptic curves, this is certainly included inside c modulo lambda, which is your elliptic curve. But now if we accept what we have, the image is some subgroup of index p inside the elliptic curve. So you can also think about this as giving yourself a subgroup p inside the elliptic curve. So, oops, this is E. And EP just denotes the p-torsion curves. So, again, we could think, for example, about the collection of all pairs uh, up to homotheny, or, for example, the collection of all elliptic curves up to isomorphism together with some subgroup of, uh, say, cyclic subgroup of index P. So again, this is probably familiar, and I'll just do one computation. That is an easy computation to do. So again, if we're thinking up to homotheny, we may as well think of our first lattice as being tau z plus z, and then just by choosing the first one appropriately, we can think of this index p lattice as being tau z plus z divided by p. Okay. So maybe I should just call this the pair uh, lambda tau inside lambda prime. So we know that lambda tau is homothetic to another lattice lambda tau prime. So this is homothetic to lambda tau prime. Uh, if tau prime equals a tau plus b on c tau plus d. But on the other hand, lambda tau prime also lives inside lambda prime tau prime. So here again, this is tau prime z plus z. This is tau prime z plus z on p. And so when you look at the homotheny that compares lambda tau to lambda tau prime, it doesn't necessarily take lambda prime tau to lambda prime tau prime. So to compute that, we just have to sort of put in and exactly see what you get. So if you think about what this lattice is here, this is just a tau plus b on c tau plus d z plus z on p, which up to the homotheny that relates these previous ones is a tau plus b z plus c tau plus d, not at the bottom here, divided by p times z. And so this lattice here, you can see, will just be the same as the lattice lambda prime tau, if not only if this is just z tau plus z on p, and that's going to be okay as long as c is divisible by p, and, and in fact, if c is divisible by p, then d will be prime to p. So you have the following description. You have, for example, well, if we think about this in the previous way, so uh, say elliptic curves over C together with a subgroup of EP, of index P, up to isomorphism, will be identified with now H modulo a different subgroup, gamma 0 P, where gamma 0 P is equal to the matrices in SL2Z, 
such that C is congruent to zero mod. And so what you can do is you can, there are plenty of variations on this theme. You can think of elliptic curve and instead of thinking about a subgroup of index P, you can think of a point of index P. And if you do that, you get a different subgroup gamma 1 P, which is equal to A, B, C, D, where our thought gamma is congruent to say 1, 0, 1 star mod P. And there are a bunch of groups you can think of gamma P, which we have to be slightly careful. Again, this corresponds to, in fact, choosing literally a basis for, for EP as a Z mod P module. Although there are various connectivity issues, which mean you would probably also want to pick some Bayes pairing. But there are a bunch of different groups which correspond to choosing not just an elliptic curve, but an elliptic curve together with extra structure. So, of course, you don't just have to have you do P, you can do L or powers of P and have various combinations of these things together. Okay. So you have corresponding quotients, say y zero p is h modulo gamma p, y one p is h modulo gamma one p, etc. And let me write y gamma as h modulo Because of course we want to define not just modular forms of level one, but modular forms of all levels, of all levels gamma, and some general gamma, a subgroup of SL2Z, or maybe a more specifically a congruent subgroup. Okay. So now we want to think about what is an algebraic description of modular forms. So first I want to do a special case that is actually uh, might be something that you're familiar with. Well, certainly some of you are, but it's, it's kind of an easier case than the general case, which is what happens when k is equal to 2. So again, let's even just resort to thinking about explicit formulas. So again, for modular forms of weight 2, we want to have a formula of the following kind, a tau plus b on c tau plus d is equal to c tau plus d squared times f of tau for all elements inside gamma. But there's something else we can just write down that has a similar behavior. Namely, if you just take the derivative of a tau plus b on c tau plus d, and you can compute this and use the fact that it's a matrix of determinant one, you just have simply the following computation. It's just a derivative. So in particular, if you write down the expression f of tau d tau, well f, which is no, wasn't invariant under the group, and nor is d tau, but this expression is invariant. And so you can interpret modular forms of weight two as sections now of this curve of the differentials. So in other words, holomorphic differentials over this curve. Again, we still haven't worried about what's happening at infinity. We'll get back to that later. So this is interpretation we'd like to have uh, now of modular forms of O8 k. So what's nice about this interpretation is we'll see in a moment that these curves y gamma, just as in the case of the J invariant, have nice models as smooth projective curves over Q, and even better models over rings of integers. And so we can start to think about this object and then reduce it mod p and make sense of that which is somehow exactly what we wanted. All right. So now uh, we want to take k to be equal to k. Well, we already somehow write, know what we want to write down. We want to write down f of tau, well, multiplied by some uh, appropriate element uh, in the, the differential to the elliptic curve. So let me just write it down as follows. We want to write down dz tensor k. So let's just not, because notation can be confusing, let's just not get z and tau confused. Tau is a parameter of the upper half plane, right? which is, this is the parameter space of elliptic curves. Z 
that's actually a parameter on the elliptic curve itself. So this is somehow a different type of object, dz, to, to d tau. So let's just think about somehow what, what is dz. So what is dz? So somehow for each point, uh, this each has a c in it, but I don't have room to put it in. So for each point of, say, y gamma, well, one thing we have, you have an elliptic curve with extra structure, but you in particular have an elliptic curve. You have an elliptic curve. E, and somehow at that point, so let me call it each point x, the elliptic curve E x, and you want to think of dz as being an element of the differentials of uh, the differentials of that particular elliptic curve. And so what we want to imagine, we want to imagine we're somehow varying up our elliptic curve. I mean, you can think about you choose a parameter tau, and you start continuously varying your elliptic curve. Now, for each elliptic curve, you have, of course, it's given by c modulo the lattice, and on c itself, you have this differential dz, and so you have a differential like this, and this family is varying as x varies along the curve. So, of course, this, I mean, per se, is just abstractly isomorphic to c. This is just a vector space of dimension 1. But, of course, it's not canonically equal to c. If this was canonically equal to c, then what we would get when you think about this is something that just essentially gives you a, a function on the entire curve. But there's some monodromy. We know that somehow, if you start at e tau, and then you wind your way around to e tau prime, well, what's going to happen to dz if you think about what happens if you start with dz in your second elliptic curve? Well, then the differential has changed by some scaling. So it's exactly that scaling that's accounting for the elliptic curve and how it changes. So what we just want to write down is uh, a nice, say, local system or line bundle, or some kind of object that really records this in the right way. So again, we're thinking about this y gamma. So let me just draw a picture of y gamma. Uh, there we go. It, it's a curve of some genus. Of course, it's mapping down to the original thing I drew with i and rho. And maybe there are some points, that, some little cone points, but there are a bunch of points that look like infinity as well. So this is our picture here. All right, so again, we're imagining for each point on this curve, we have an elliptic curve with some level structure. So what we would like to do is somehow build that into an entire family of elliptic curves. That's what we should think of. Over each point, we have some elliptic curve. And so over the entire object y, we have some big family of elliptic curves mapping down. Okay. And then when we think about dz, again, we're thinking about this elliptic curve varies. What are the differentials on this elliptic curve at each point, and how do they vary? So what's the right object to look at? Well, we somehow we want to look at the differentials of e relative to y. Right? We're looking at, at differentials with respect to e, but the, the base is something that's not as far as we want to think of, somehow each point we want to think about it as being a constant. So this is a uh, this is a local system on local system on on E. So what we do is we just take the projection of this local system uh, down to the base. And so now this is a local system. Uh, this is a definition. So I can put equals. So you have just some sheaf on this E, and you push it down to omega. So this omega is supposed to be uh, recording what's going on. So let's just do the computation. What we want to do is we want to look at what happens when we just look at omega at some local point x. We just want to concentrate omega at some elliptic curve. So what we have, well, this just should be, of course, it's by definition. It's this right-hand side. And then we want to look at what happens in x. And now I just pass 
this push board, and I put it inside this X. Okay, so now if I do it like this, so now what's going on, now I have this local system, but I want to think about it at some particular point X, so I'm specializing to Y to X, so what is that specialization? So specialized to X, this is just going to be, and I'm running out of room, but fortunately it will still be displayed here. This should just be I lower star, and now I should just have the differentials of the specific elliptic curve over the specific point. Of course, that will just be the complex numbers, so then I'll have this object. I'm missing some equality signs. And if you just have an elliptic curve over a point, what's the push forward of a, of a, of a bundle? It's just the global sections. So this would just be a zero of the elliptic curve and the differentials of this elliptic curve. So that's exactly what we wanted. This was somehow the object uh, we wanted to vary. And just by writing this, uh, this relative chief of differentials down and pushing forward, we exactly have something that somehow gives us exactly this vector space, this vector space with a dz that's transforming in the right way. Now, of course, therefore, dz to the power of k, we just have to take this line bundle tends to k. So we have the following description of uh, modular forms of weight k as sections of now y and now this local system to the power of k. All right, so, all right, so this is now a nice description. So there are various things to remark here. One is that you have to be a little bit careful with pushing things forward and taking stocks, but everything is nice because this projection map pi is a proper map. So that's, a, that's something we're allowed to do. Another thing that's kind of confusing is if you think about k is equal to two, well, then you have two descriptions, namely h0 of omega squared and h0 of the sheaf of differentials. That's kind of two descriptions of things in weight two. So fortunately, there's, well, maybe this is something that comes out of what we computed by proof. There's an isomorphism uh, between these two local systems on one. And that's two things. There's one more thing that uh, I've somehow swept underneath the rug, but it somehow is important, is that we've, we've written down this universal family E, but it's not so clear that it really actually exists. And that's something to do with the fact that these moduli spaces are not always fine moduli spaces in general. So this is maybe a kind of, it's really a technical point, and as opposed to a genuine point, but it's something that just comes up, and it'll come up in just a moment when we kind of consider uh, some specific examples. So really, to do this, it's better uh, for, say, y equal to, say, y1 of p, or y of p, say, rather, than, say, y1 itself. And there's a good reason you can see that something with y1 is going to go horribly wrong. If you think about what y1 is, we just described it as basically being affine space. So, well, of course, we haven't talked about the cusps, and we may anticipate, and it will be true, that when we put in the cusps, we'll just get sections of the various completed uh, curves. But you can see that if you just take x0, 1, you might end up thinking that modular forms of weight k correspond to global sections of, say, x of 1 and some w to the omega to the k. But if you think about what x1 is, this is just projective space. And there aren't very many line bundles on projective space. They're basically all the form OD. So this would have to be something like ODK. And well, depending on whether D is positive or negative, if you look at the dimension of these guys, well, it doesn't look anything like the dimension of the space of classical modular forms. I mean, it looks a little bit like it in the sense that this will be linear 
But if you think about spaces of modular forms of level one, there's a horrible mess that goes on with what the, what the weight is mod 12. There's also nothing of odd weight, which doesn't really make any sense in this context. So you have to be a little bit careful with this definition. You just, for example, have to make sure that the level is somehow big enough. Okay. So this is horribly wrong. You end up doing a computation and, and imagining something like d is equal to a 12. So again, there are two fixes. One is to think of x1 in a sort of more of a stacky way. Uh, another way is to define modular forms of level one by first defining modular forms of level four and defining modular forms of level three and essentially taking modular forms of level one to roughly be the intersection of those two spaces, which seems an incredibly roundabout method, but on the other hand, it isn't correct. Okay. So, well, we still haven't gotten around to what's happening at infinity. If we want our spaces to be nice and finite dimensional, we want to have some kind of condition at infinity, which in the algebraic world corresponds to working with, uh, say, proper or projective spaces. So next, I want to talk about cusps. Okay. So again, let's still think about everything over C. So we have our elliptic curve. So we want to see what happens when we let the parameter tau approach i times infinity, which just amounts to q is e to the 2 pi i tau approaching 0. So one thing that's convenient to do, if we want to think about this as being a parameter, we want to write things in terms of q. So for example, what I can do is I can take my elliptic curve, and then I can take the exponential map, 2 pi i star. So the exponential map takes c to c star. It takes z, well, it goes to e to the 2 pi i z, which is just 1, which is the identity here. And it takes tau to q. So this is just an isomorphism of groups from your elliptic curve to c star mod q to the z. So we can write our elliptic curve in terms of the parameter q instead of tau. So previously, what did we have? We had y squared. We had a Weierstrass equation involving, um, say, y squared is 4x cubed minus 60 g4. Now I'll write it in terms of qx minus 140 g6 cubed. And what you can do, when you have these Eisenstein series, you can compute their Q expansions. And what you find is you find that there are actually Q expansions whose coefficients are all in Z. Well, actually, you don't quite find that because you have powers of 2 pi i. And you also have some irritation with respect to the primes 2 and 3, which are coming from the fact that the Weierstrass equation is written in this form rather than some more complicated form. But nevertheless, after modifying, so let me just ignore primes above, say, 2 and 3 at the moment. You can write down an equation, y squared equals, I'll just still say 4x cubed, minus ax minus b, where a and b are now elements of z with 6 inverted and, and, up, and just power series in q. So they're very, I could write them down explicitly. That these are just Eisenstein series. There's nothing mysterious about what they are. And you can write these things down. So all the, this is just an analytic parameterization at this point. But now what we can do is we can just stare at this equation. And we could say, well, what is this? Well, it is an elliptic curve. But now it's an elliptic curve instead of over C. It's just over the appropriate base. Right, so we can think about this. Well, this is going to be a lie. So we can first think about this as just an elliptic curve over z1 on 6 double brackets q. So why is this a lie? So what is an elliptic curve over a ring? Well, it should certainly be the case with this elliptic curve 
that when you take its discriminant, its discriminant uh, should be should be invertible. So we should compute the discriminant of this elliptic curve. So what's the discriminant of the elliptic curve? You can compute the discriminant of the elliptic curve. Well, it's going to be something in this ring. It's going to be a power series in Q, and it's equal to Q minus 24 Q squared. I, maybe I know one more term. 252 Q cubed. Someone might tell me if this is wrong. It's actually, well, no surprise, it's equal to this modular form, 1 minus Q to the n to the power of 24. So that's what the Q, that's what the discriminant is. So the discriminant is a unit, well, as long as Q is a unit. So in fact, this equation, the equation defines uh, an elliptic curve, which I'll call TQ, over this ring where you've now inverted Q. So, well, since I'm tired of writing one on six, I'm just going to ignore it. You have a ring now over just the Laurent series. And if you want to include primes above two and three, which you do, instead of writing in this way, you modify it in some way to avoid uh, the denominators of two and three that are really just occurring in the constant terms of the Eisenstein polynomials so that they're easily dealt with. OK, so now we have an elliptic curve over here. So now what can we do? Well, let's think now of a modular form. A modular form of weight k, you can evaluate it as long as you have an elliptic curve together with a differential. So if we want to evaluate it, for example, on this elliptic curve, what we would like is to have a differential of this elliptic curve. So what's the differential? Well, we can compute it, at least the obvious one. So of course, on C mod lambda, an obvious differential is, uh, is dz. OK, but now we have to have a new parameter because we're taking uh, the exponential map. So well, z is mapping to e to the 2 pi i z on this exponential map. And so in particular, so let's say call this parameter t, then dz, if I can differentiate correctly, is 2 pi i e to the 2 pi i z. Uh, I'm getting myself very confused. This would probably be dt times dz. Uh, or in other words, dt divided by t and 1 on 2 pi i is equal to dz. So that's the differential. It's dt on t, or up to a scalar. So we therefore think about the take curve tq comes with a canonical differential, which we just write as dt on t. And if we want to think about this more algebraically, well, instead of thinking, for example, as C modulo Q to the Z, you can think about GM modulo Q to the Z. So GM, of course, corresponds to ZT, T inverse. And again, DT on T is just the obvious invariant differential on that group space. Okay. So, what that allows us to do is given, given a modular form f of weight k, you can evaluate it on the Tate curve with this canonical differential, and you'll get an element of this power series. So we're starting again with our modular form, but in the most general sense, we want our modular form to be defined over z, so we can plug in elliptic curves defined over the most general. So in other words, we go on for a modular form, we can construct a Q expansion. So what is that? That's just what we would call the Q expansion of the modular form. So we'll just 
say this is the this is the cube. Okay. So, oops. So now for the module form, we can construct two expression. If you think just about now classical module form in the most analytic way, well, if you take an analytic module form, you can of course, well, of course, it won't be defined over the take curve, but it'll be defined over the take curve over the complex numbers. And then just doing this process is nothing more than just writing your modular form in terms of powers of Q, or in other words, in just terms of taking its Fourier expansion. So in other words, thinking about the take curve as an algebraic object allows you to have an algebraic version of the Fourier expansion. So now we could finally define what a modular form is. So now define a modular form uh, of weight K over a ring R. Okay, so we think about R as being C, we can think about it as being something more general. So on the one hand, we have a function defined on pairs of an elliptic curve together with a differential uh, inside H of E, again, with nowhere vanishing. Such that when you scale, again, by a unit in R, you get uh, the same value back up to the appropriate power. So that's what we've had all along. So if we want to work now over general rings R, you have to have some compatibility when you change from R to S. So say, for example, you have uh, an R algebra S, well, then you have to have Somehow, if you evaluate f of er and omega, that's just the same as if you put it down to es and take the appropriate quantities of r and es. Okay, so let me just uh, say exactly what I'm doing here. So here, if we just think here about r as being the complex numbers, this is just exactly the definition of, of module form we had before. If we want to allow ourselves more general rings, we just want exactly the same property. And finally, if we pass from one ring to another, we want it to somehow transform in the obvious way. For example, if you want a modular form of a Q, and it has a particular value in some way in which you can evaluate it, if you then think about that modular form of a Q as a modular form of a C, the value you get should just be that number of a Q thought of as a number of a C. And finally, one more thing, which we have to can finally address this issue at the cusps, if we now evaluate f at the take curve defined over the ring R, well, what do you usually ask for module form? That it's non-vanishing at the cusp. Well, you now that we ask that instead of just landing inside the power series ring of R, uh, sorry, the Laurent series, we ask that this actually doesn't have any Q inverse terms. So we ask that this lies inside the power series ring. So it's a little bit complicated, ultimately, algebraically, to define modular forms. But the complication, one of the complications is coming from understanding what's going on at the cusps. And what's going on at the cusps is more difficult because literally at the cusp itself, there's no elliptic curve. And so you have to somehow, well, at least in this way, you can just kind of shrink locally around, around it. OK, so let's just. Uh, do some examples. Okay. So, uh, example. So, so given an E and a differential, you can write down a Weierstrass equation: x cubed minus ax minus b. Okay. 
All right, so then, what are the examples of modular forms? Well, then, A and B are modular forms. of weights four and six, respectively. Okay, just because you know that if we scale the differential, A and B will be scaled by fourth and sixth power, respectively. So these are not modular forms you don't know already. These are just the Eisenstein series E4 and E6 up to some scalar. Okay. So of course, we can also take uh, delta, which will be some polynomial of A and B. This will be a modular form of weight 12. So again, I mean, the modular forms that we get, certainly of the complex numbers, is the same modular forms we know and love, but now we just have a more algebraic description of them. So one thing that's important to note is that if we think about modular forms in the classical sense, you know, if I'm just thinking about modular forms of, of over C, I, I want to think about them just in terms of their Q expansion. Certainly, if you know the Q expansion of a holomorphic function, you know the function. So one thing that's important is that we can actually tell what the modular form is from its Q expansion. I mean, at the moment, the modular form, in the Q expansion is just what we get by evaluating this modular form at a particular point. But you might hope that since we're evaluating really in some, say, uh, some sort of formal disk, or at least formal punctured disk around the cusp, that that has enough information to know about the rest of the module form, and indeed that's true. So we have the following, well, it's various things which go by the name of the Q expansion principle. So we have the following is that the Q expansion uh, map is injective. So if we think about our module forms, which we've defined, say our module forms of weight k are uh, for a ring R, then uh, we have an injection of that into the okay. So again, I've been a little bit lax about what we want to think about in terms of level structure as well. So what about modular forms with level structure? Well, mostly the level structure just comes along for the ride. So instead about thinking of a function defined on elliptic curves together with a differential, you think about modular forms f Defined for elliptic curves, together with a differential, together with some level structure. And it has satisfied the usual compatibility. So, so compatible in the natural ways. So we had various compatibilities before if you change the ring. So here, of course, if you replace an elliptic curve by something isomorphic to it, and the level structures pull back, then of course it shouldn't depend on that and other, other properties uh, of this form. And again, we have the following algebraic description. So, okay, so now I need to take a bit of a detour, which is going to be more of a cop-out detour. So I want to talk about, ah, and this, was, this is the moment in which I don't know how to spell Rappaport. <laughs> this is like, oh, this is being filmed, isn't it? Yes, OK. <laughs> Okay, so we've described these modular, these modular curves, say x, sorry, y, say y0, p, y1, p, etc. So again, we've described them 
as just naturally ways of parametrizing elliptic curves with some level structure. But we see already just by looking at y and comparing it just to the affine line in terms of the J invariant is that these curves have this algebraic structure and moreover have an algebraic structure defined over a number field and moreover have an algebraic structure defined over a ring of integers. So the key point is that, so we have the following is that Yn, so it actually has, so there's two facts, oh yeah, so one it has uh, sort of, so the natural compactification, Xn, I mean this is true for all gamma, so in other words, there's a way of filling in the cusps. And on a level of the complex numbers, this is very easy. We think of just x1, you had a single point of infinity. These are just all covers, and so that, that point just pulls back to natural cusps on the covers. But then moreover, is that xn actually has a, a smooth projective model of a Z1 on N. Okay. So what does this mean for us? Well, of course this is a nice smooth projective curve. So it basically means two things. One about you can think about it over Q, but also that it has good reduction as long as you avoid primes dividing N. So these are facts that are in some sense, uh, well, uh, they're not easy to establish, but they are no way necessary to understand. Well, the, uh, understanding the arguments is a little bit orthogonal to what we're going to be thinking about, so taking them on faith is not really uh, the worst thing to do. I'm going to quickly move this slide. So let me just kind of assemble some various facts that we that we now have. So we can think, say now modular forms of level gamma and weight k are defined over R and if we assume, say, that gamma, uh, there's some containment of gamma n, we'll assume that R is a Z1 on n algebra. So now this space, just assembling things together, we can describe this by looking now at the global sections of xr, and now the kth power of this local system that we previously constructed before. And now again, here I've told a lie already. This omega we constructed by pushing forward this relative chief of differentials on the universal elliptic curve, but that doesn't really obviously exist when we pass to this completion. So you need to interpret what's going on at these cusps, they're no longer elliptic curves, but rather some notion of a generalized elliptic curve, but yet there still exists a sheaf of relative differentials, and it still makes sense to talk about this local system, and it still makes sense to have this construction. So we know some various facts. So we know that it's determined by their Q expansion. So this is a very useful fact, because on one level it really means that you can, uh, I mean, one way to think about this is you could ignore the complications and then say, well, now I can just think about Q expansions, and as long as I keep track of their coefficients and make sure that I keep note of what ring they're over, I can now start reducing them mod P and start playing around with them in some way like that. So although it's important to know that the constructions make sense, once you have them in place, you can really manipulate them on a very hands-on level. So of course, again, this description only makes sense for so-called fine gamma. Uh, 
in general, of course, there's a description just in terms of a rule that makes sense regardless of the level or the weight. Okay. So here, finally, no, well, not finally, but some, some more facts. So there's always a map. There's a map from, say, modular forms, say, over, so now let me just say, specifically choose R to be Z1 on N, and level gamma inside gamma N. So I can take these modular forms and then map them to R mod P equals FP for primes P not dividing N. So I'm just taking my modular forms and reducing them mod p. And so let me make the following remark. So again, here, lemma. This is surjective uh, if the level is at least 3 and the weight is at least 2. Moving it all the time. So there's always just a very natural map, but you have a surjectivity like this. So let me kind of explain why this is. Well, how would you try to prove surjectivity? Well, on the one hand, if you had a description in terms of cohomology, you would try to say you would have a map, say, for example, from Z. Well, you may as well think about it, for example, as being ZP omega k, and there's a natural map from this to h0x of fp, omega k. So we would ask, is this subjective? And again, as a relatively easy exercise, you, you see that the answer is yes, if h1 of x fp omega to the k is equal to zero. So it's a copy done in the notes, but it's just an easy computation. So here we have this omega. So it's not so hard to see that this omega, well, you can compute what its degree is. Why can you compute what its degree is? Well, omega squared is essentially the sheaf of differentials by the Kadai Spencer isomorphism. So you essentially know the degree is roughly uh, g. And so you have to take into account the contribution from the cusp as well. But you get this if k is big or equal to g just for degree reasons. So that's where the k is big or equal to 2 condition comes up. So um, well, what happens if k is equal to 1? So if k is equal to 1, it's false in general. So Mestra found an example where n was 14, 29, p was equal to 2. Uh, Buzzard found an example where n was 82 and p was 199. And George Schaefer found an example. Well, that's in the notes. Some fairly large prime. Okay. So module forms of weight 1, they're very mysterious from the perspective that they don't necessarily lift a characteristic zero. So here's where we see the k to be equal to 2 condition comes up. But what happened to n big or equal to 3? Where does that come in? Well, secretly, we're using the fact that we can even write down this omega, which involves having some fine moduli space, which involves, um, uh, which involves n being big or equal to 3. So well, you might think. You might think you know about modular forms of level one, and you might think, well, can't you just compute it by hand? But in fact, there are modular forms of level one that don't lift a characteristic zero. So what are they? Well, let me explain it. So let me just write one down. So now let's think about n is equal to one. Let me turn the pen this way. So again, let's take an elliptic curve and a Weierstrass equation. So I'm going to imagine the characteristic 
well, that P is going to be equal to 2. So I'm going to construct a modular form of F2. So what can I do in elliptic curve and differential? I can write down a Weierstrass equation. Well, now I really want to do be, a, be a bit careful when I write down a Weierstrass equation characteristic 2. I want to write down the following Weierstrass equation. That looks wrong. Something's not adding up here. R2 comes before 4. So this is a, a general Weierstrass equation. So of course, it's not unique. There's a bunch of different transformations that you can make. But because we're in characteristic 2, there's actually a fairly restrictive number of, uh, of, of different things you can do. And in fact, what you can see is that all the transformations in characteristic 2, all transformations, well, again, if they're fixing omega, then they also fix a1. So in fact, what that means is this coefficient a1 is actually a modular form of weight 1 and level 1, so I don't get weight level confused, defined over f2. So there's a modular form of level 1 you may not have thought about before. It's defined over f2, and it's just a1. It's easy to compute for a variety of equation. And it doesn't lift a characteristic 0 for the fairly easy reason that in characteristic 0, there aren't even any modular forms odd weight, and certainly not weight, uh, weight 1. So it, it, this is false. This lifting property is false uh, in these weights for these various reasons. Uh, but but still, um, uh, one can sort of see what's going on. So you might think, why haven't I seen this form A1 before? What is its mysterious Q expansion defined mod 2 that, you know, that, that should surely be some interesting Q expansion mod 2 that I haven't seen before? What is the Q expansion? So I'm kind of running out of time, so let me just at least give you the answer, and then we'll start explain this a bit more next time. So what is the Q expansion of A2? I've told you it's determined by its Q expansion. So it's, it's as follows. Yes, that's a good question. That's a good point. A2 is, well, OK. Thank you. Well, it's given as follows. Okay, now I can do what Ken did. That was the title of his talk. It's the last word of mine. It's what? That's the, the Q expansion is what? 